And hey, welcome to those who are joining us online and welcome to all of our guests. Come on, church, let's welcome everyone to church this morning. So hey, we started a series last week called Last Words. And what we're doing is for the next seven weeks, well now six weeks, we're going through the last words of Jesus as he stood or as he hung on the cross. And as I said last week, whenever you're by someone and they're speaking their last words, what they say is really important. And you kind of hold those to you for the rest of your life. Um, and, and so Jesus is on the cross, and he'll be on the cross for six hours. And, and he said seven things within those seven hours. And, and so this uh, will take us all the way up to Easter, Easter Sunday. We will finish the last one. Uh, we will uh, do a uh, Good Friday service where, uh, if you know your Bible and you know the story, he says, it is finished. And that's what we're going to talk about. And uh, I just want to kind of give you a, a, a quick intro into that a little bit. He didn't say, I'm finished. He said, it is finished. And so we're going to talk about what it is uh, on Good Friday. So I encourage you to come out. Good Friday service, 7 o'clock. We're going to have communion that night. We're going to do some worship, and then I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. The last, uh, on Easter Sunday, uh, he says, into your hands I commit my spirit. And it's going, to be, it's going to be an incredible Easter message because here's what we know. The only reason why we celebrate Easter is because he didn't die on the cross and stay that way. Amen. Oh, come on now. Come on, church. Let me, let me back up. The reason why we celebrate Easter is because when he died on the cross, he didn't stay dead. Yeah. yeah, there you go. There's my church. There you are. I know you lost an hour. It's okay. I did too. I told Sherry a while ago, I said, I'm not a fortune teller, but I sure do see a nap in my future. I'm saying, yo. <laughs> so anyway, hey, uh, just real quick, as you leave today, uh, there are some Easter invite cards um, in, our, in our invite holder out by, in the lobby. Grab some of those and start inviting people to our Easter service. And uh, here's what I know. More churches are Googled during the Easter season than any other time. Because people, people want to be at church. People want to be at church. Whether they go all year or not, they want to be at church. And, so, and, and this is what this says. 67% say that a personal invitation would be very effective in getting them to visit your church. 67% of people said they would go to church if you would invite them. That's pretty incredible. So as you guys know, I didn't get saved till I was almost 19. I never was invited to church by one of my friends. I'm going to assume that none of my friends were Christians. If they were, they kept it a secret. They were really good at keeping it a secret. Um, but so seven out of 10 unchurched people have never been invited to church. I want you to think about this. Think about Walmart. Seven out of ten people that you're in line with, checking out, have never been invited to church. That's incredible. Because we live in a church-saturated community doesn't mean that people are being invited to church. And here's the last one. The uh, research shows that eight out of ten people would come if asked. Eight out of ten people would come if Uh, So let's start inviting some of the 16,000 people that are unchurched in our county. Let's get out there and grab some of these cards and invite, invite, invite. It's not because I want a full room, man. I want a full heaven, though. And so we are going to reach heaven if it takes us. It's going to take, if it takes everything in us, we're going to reach and we're going to fill heaven. Amen? Amen. You guys will be convinced here soon. We will. But hey, so go ahead and grab those message notes as you uh, came in, and uh, we're going to jump into God's Word, and we're going to study it. And uh, let me ask you a question as I start off. How many of you are list people? Like you have a list. Well, you have a, a list, of, a grocery list. Anybody do, do grocery list? Yeah, yeah. Those are nice, aren't they? Now, okay, you ready? How many of you actually follow it when you get to the store? Wow, y'all some disciplined people. Now, some of y'all are saying didn't go up because... You're like us, and you're like, ooh, that looks good. I know it's not on the list, but it's going in the cart. <laughs> uh, you have a to-do list. You have an Amazon wish list. Can I get an amen, somebody? I have a wish list. Ooh, it grows all the time. 
Maybe some of you have a prayer list or you have people on your prayer list. And here's what I know. We know Santa has a list and he is checking it twice. And what's he trying to figure out? Who's naughty or nice? He's checking it twice. And here's what I also know. We have a list too. We have a list of who gets to go to heaven and who doesn't. We have a list that says this, if I'm good enough, I will get to go to heaven. We have a list that says if my good deeds outweigh yours, I'm going to heaven and sorry for you. Right? And, and so we live this life that, that we, we have these lists of uh, I get to go to heaven if I'm good. And, and so y'all know the, the, the show All Dogs Go to Heaven? Hey, have you ever seen that? You ever notice there's not all cats go to heaven? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I always have to throw a cat joke in. That's all right. Uh, but here's what I know. We all, believe, we all believe that lie that all people go to heaven. Or hell is only reserved for the really, really bad people. Like growing up, I always believed that I would go to heaven. I wasn't a, a, a church person at all, but I still believed in heaven and hell. And I believed because I was better than some people that I was automatically going to go to heaven. So the, last, the, last, the second last word from the cross answers the question, who gets to go to heaven? Who gets to go to heaven? Because here's what I know. So many times I read on Facebook or I read in an obituary or I read wherever. And listen, I never see where someone says, oh, they're in hell. It's, they're in heaven. But how do you know that? How do you know they're in heaven? How do you know you're, when you die, you're going to go to heaven? Listen to me. There is a heaven to gain and a hell to, to reject. But we live in a culture that says, if you're good, you can go to heaven. And can I, can, I, can I tell you something? That is the biggest lie from the devil. It's huge. It's huge. And so, anyway, Jesus talked about who gets to go to heaven on his second word from the cross. And if you have your Bible, you can open up to Luke 23, verse 39 and 43. If you do not, it will be behind me, uh, screen behind me. It says this, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him, Jesus. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you, you will be, today, you will be with me in paradise. Today, not tomorrow, not next year, not if you belong to a religion that just will pray you out. If you give enough money, I'm going to, no, no, no. Jesus said, today you can know that you're in heaven, but it ain't by your own good work. It's by his good work. It's by what he did on the cross, not what you do in your life. It's the initial acceptance is because of what he did, not what you do. And so here we go. If you're taking notes, jot the first one down. Heaven is for forgiven people, not good people. Heaven is for good, forgiven people, not good people. So I have a ladder up here, as you can see, right? So I want you to think about this ladder for a moment. Up here, God's standard. That's God's standard. Okay? So, we live our life. We know what God's standard is. We, we see what God's standard is. We know it's up there. So, here's what we do. We live our life trying to climb this ladder. Right? We think if we go to church enough, if we give enough, if we serve, if we help the poor, if we clothe the naked, if we do all these things, we will climb this ladder. But the problem is, what happens when you don't, when you don't do good things or you do a bad thing? You come back down. You come back down. Because the Bible says, you can pull that up there real quick. Romans 3.23 says, for all have uh, fallen, are sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
How many? All. So if God's standard is here, and we're supposed to reach here, how do we get there? A lot of people believe that they're supposed to climb this ladder called good deeds. But listen to me. Hell is full of people that are good. Heaven is empty of people that are good. Because good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. Forgiven people go to heaven, not good people. But we live our life trying to climb the ladder called goodness. We, we, we live our life trying to climb that ladder of, of goodness. So how do we get up there? We don't. The entire message of Easter is that this, Jesus removed the ladder, and he came down to us. That's the entire message of Easter, everybody. So if Jesus took away the ladder, why are we still trying to climb it? Now, am I talking about you're not supposed to do good? No, 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 no. We should. But if we're doing good to get to heaven, we're actually going to go to hell, thinking that we were good enough for heaven. No one is good enough for heaven besides God himself. First Timothy 1.5 says, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And what does Paul say? Who I am the worst. That's pretty bold when you can look out and go, I am the worst sinner of them all. If Paul to say that he was a sinner and the worst of them all, what does that put us? And and so it's not about us getting to God, it's about Jesus coming to us. That's what Easter's about. That's what what this entire Easter season is about. If you're a believer, then you know there are no good people in heaven because you know you're not good. I want you to think about that. You're not good. I'm not good. You're not good. You know why I know that? Because Jesus was called good, and he said there's no one good but God, which he was referring to himself. If there's only one good person in the entire world, universe, whatever, what does that make you and me? It makes us sinful. It makes us sinner. And so if we're not good enough to get to heaven, how do we get there? How do good, how do forgiven people get to heaven? Take a note, jot this down. Forgiven people own their sin. So if heaven is full of forgiven people, how do forgiven people get there? They own their sin. They own their sin. I want you to hear this. Both criminals asked Jesus to save them. Did they not? The first criminal goes, hey, if you are the Messiah, if you are who you say you are, save both of us, save us. But we know the first criminal didn't want to be saved from sin. He wanted to be saved from the consequences of sin. He wanted to be saved from the cross. He didn't want to be saved through the cross. There's a big difference. And and so both of them wanted to be saved but only one got saved because only one said, I did wrong. I did wrong. The, the first criminal said, if you are who you say you are, then save yourself. And what did the second guy say? We deserve to be here. We deserve to be here. We deserve to be hanging on the cross because we did things that we shouldn't have done. We are legit criminals. This guy in the middle is not a criminal. There's something different about this guy. Because last week we talked about where Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Do you not think those criminals heard Jesus praying that prayer? If, he, if Jesus was an evil, wicked guy, would he have been praying, Father, forgive them? No, no, no. He would have been praying, Father, sick them. Destroy them. And then even the, even the, the sign above his head 
told the entire Roman world who he was. He is the king of the Jews. You don't think those guys recognized what he, it, it said and what they were saying? But only one got saved that day, and it was the one that said, I messed up. It's my sin. It's, it's my doing. Again, just to read it, he says in Luke 23, don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Did you catch that? He said, we are getting what we deserve. We are getting what we deserve. I want you to notice, a person who sees their sin stops blaming God and others for their problems and admits their own guilt and shame. How many times have I heard people blaming the system? Well, if the system was whatever, I wouldn't be a thief. No, you're a thief because you're a thief. How how many times have I heard people blaming their parents? Well, if I didn't grow up this way, I wouldn't be this way. No, you're that way because you choose to be that way. I've, I've talked extensively about how you could break the generational curse in your life if you apply it to your life. You don't have to live, you don't have to do the same sin your, your parents did or your siblings do or your grandparents do or whatever. You could break the curse. You have to choose to break the curse, though. And the only way you could break it is through Jesus. He wasn't blaming anybody. He admitted he was getting what he deserved for his crime. You ever notice we're good about pointing out other people's sins? Well, I'm not as bad as that guy. I'm not as bad as her. Well, guess what? If you if your goodness compared to someone another sinner, you're not doing very well. Like if I compare my righteousness to someone else's righteousness. Isaiah says, our righteousness are filthy rags. I'm not even going to go into what that really means. It's nasty. And so if I'm comparing my righteousness with Sherry's righteousness, she's comparing her righteousness with mine, which she would be better. Thank God we're not judged by that because she's a lot better than that. But if we're comparing against each other, we're both, fail- we're both sinners and we're both failing all the time. So I don't need to compare my sin with yours. You don't need to compare your sin with me. You know who we need to compare ourselves with? The perfect person named Jesus. And if we're not reaching that standard, then something's got to change, and it's not him, it's us. And that's why he came, that's why he came down. Forgiving people own their sin. People, listen, I say this all the time. If you call your sin a mistake, that is not repentance or confession. That is saying, I'm sorry I got caught. If you call your sin an oops, you didn't oops into sin, you walked into it. Like, I've never met anybody go, oh, I accidentally sinned. Yeah, sure you did. Sure. It's not an accident. Right? Listen, I can convince you, it's not an accident. We sin because we want to. The Bible's very clear on that. We have to own our sin, though. We can't blame the system. We can't blame the government. We can't blame the world. We can't blame our parents. We can't blame our spouses. We have to own it. Listen, if you don't own your sin, you don't get forgiven for your sin. 1 John 1, 9 says this, If we confess our sins, be faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from what? All unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, do y'all know what, what, what the word sin means? That's from the mark. So here's the mark. This is what we're supposed to hit. Anytime we don't hit this and we're, you know, angry or jealous or lust or whatever, we're messing the mark. That's called sin. We have to own that we mess the mark in order to be forgiven. The word confess there in the Greek means to say the same thing about your sin that God says about your sin. God never calls sin an oops or a mistake. He calls it a sin. We have to call it for what it is. So the guy on the cross is saying, I did it, I did it, I did it. It's me, I deserve to be up here. The other guy goes, just get us out of here. Just get us out of here. 
Look at what happened when this guy realized who Jesus was. It changed him and his eternity. So the one thing we focus on here, we want to help people know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. Because we believe that when you know who God is, when you know God, you will live your life making a difference. Until you know God, until you know him, you can't make a significant eternal difference. You might be able to make a worldly difference, but that'll go away when you die. But you can make an eternal difference right now. When people come to know God, it causes them to own their sin. Jot this last one down, you're saying, no. Forgiven people see their need for Jesus. Forgiven people see their need for Jesus. Luke 24, 42, 43. Says, then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus said, him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me where? In paradise. Paradise is with God. It's with Jesus. I want you to, I, we, we got to hear this. He said, today you will be with me. Not tomorrow. Not the next day. Not a hundred years from now. Today. Look, and I know some of, you, some of you grew up Catholic or you are a Catholic or whatever, but that is one of the biggest lies from the Catholic Church today. Purgatory. There's nowhere in the Bible that it talks about that you go to a holding place when you die. You either go to heaven or you go to hell. There is no in between. So can I, can, let me be honest with you. And I try not to talk about other faiths because, it's, you know, but I'm going to talk about this one. The reason why people believe that is because it makes them feel better about their sin. What happens if nobody prays for you, though? What happens if no one gives money for you, though? I like my odds better on Jesus than somebody praying me out of somewhere. <laughs> what if they forget to pray for me? You ever forgot to pray for someone? <laughs> and, and I laugh because I'm trying to lighten the mood a little bit. But it's not funny in that. When we die, the Bible says we to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. That is now, not later. I mean, to 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 to, to say that you have to wait to go to heaven. I mean, other listen. All religions besides Christianity teach that you don't automatically go to heaven. You have to be good enough to go to heaven. You have to do these things to go to heaven. Da 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 da. da. All listen. Christianity is the only religion that teaches you don't have to do anything to get to heaven because you accept Jesus as your Savior. And listen, without Jesus drawing you to himself, you can't even do that. It takes the Holy Spirit to draw you to him. So forgiven people see their need for Jesus. The, the, guy, the guy saw his need for, for Jesus. When we go to Jesus and ask him to save us, he does it immediately. Acts 16, I think I'm about to take something, but I'm going to read the scripture to give proof what I'm about to say. Acts 16, 30 to 31, says, he then brought them out and asked, sir, what must I do to be saved? And they replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. I want you to notice something, okay? Because there are other Christian, Christian organizations that, that teach that you have to be water baptized to be saved. Well, this guy next, next to Jesus just dismantled that entire belief. What did Jesus say? Did he say you have to get off the cross and be baptized and go to heaven? And then what did they just tell the jailer in, in, in Acts? All you got to do is repent and believe you get to go to heaven. If we add, listen to me, I want you to hear this. If we add anything to the cross, if we add anything to Jesus, we then empty the cross of its power. Anything. 
So if you ever hear, if a pastor ever tells you, you can only be saved if A, B, and C happens, you need to leave that church. Because the Bible is very specific that only thing we need to do to be saved is to repent and, and believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Salvation in Jesus is immediate. Immediate. It's now. It's certain. Like, so here's the thing. I never, and I don't say this pridefully at all, okay? I never wonder if I'm saved. I know some people struggle with their wonder of salvation and things like that, and, and that's okay. I never wake up in the morning and go, I wonder if I'm a Christian still. I'm like, I wonder if I locked in, in traffic, you know? <laughs> like, Jesus now walked out of the car. He's gone. Like, <laughs> come back, Holy Spirit. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I've never woke up and go, I wonder if I'm saved. I never do. And it's not a prideful, cocky statement. It is, I just believe what this says. And this says that because I repented, because I believe, because I asked Jesus into my life, I'm saved. Does that mean I don't live for Jesus after that? No, 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 no. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is you can know for a fact that you're saved by believing what this book said. If you do struggle with salvation, whether or not you're saved, but you, you've asked Jesus to forgive you, you just have to walk by faith. Okay, I may not feel like, I, I, Monday morning I may not feel saved, but I know that I asked Jesus to forgive me. I know that I'm walking with Jesus. I am saved. Devil, shut up. I am saved. If you struggle with whether or not you're saved, but you're not walking with Jesus, you've never asked him to forgive you, you're not saved. Two different people on that, next to Jesus on the cross. One died and went to hell, and the other one died and went to heaven. Why? Because he owned his sin. And he saw his need for Jesus. In Christ, we have confidence that this is in the end. Jesus said today, not tomorrow, not if someone prays you out, not maybe. He said today you will be with me in paradise. You can know it out of doubt, church, that when you die on this side of the earth, when you close your eyes here, you will open your eyes in eternity forever in the presence of the Lord. A church can't give you that confidence. A pastor can't give you that confidence. Jesus gives you that confidence. Jesus offers Jesus offer doesn't just offer a better now. He offers a better place. As much as I love living, as much as I love my family, there's nothing going to be better than when I close my eyes here and I wake up in eternity. And I get to look at that guy right there who saved my life, who changed my life, who changed my family, who did so much for me. Am I perfect? Do I get it wrong? I am not perfect and I get it wrong all the time. But because he removed the ladder, <laughs> he moved the ladder. <laughs> Because the, because the ladder moved, I don't have to climb the ladder. He came to me. He came to you. But the only way to get to heaven, and I know for some of you are like, it's so basic. I don't. But some of us just don't understand it. The only way to get to Jesus is by admitting your sin and, and seeing your need for Jesus. That's it. That is it. Jesus doesn't just offer heaven, though. So it, some of us, we get so caught up in heaven, and it's a great place. But until you die and go there, you have to live now. And he gives you peace. He gives you hope. He gives you healing. He gives you provision. He gives you all of these things. That is all because of the cross. All because of the cross. I'm going to close with this. Three people died that day. One man died, I, want, I, you need, I need you to hear this. One man died in his sin. One man died forgiven 
from his sin. And then one man died for the sin. Three people died that day. One died in a sin, one died forgiven, one died for all. There are two people in this room right now or watching online. One of you, you are, you are in the category of Jesus died for you. He died for your sin and you given your life to Jesus. The other group, you haven't given your life to Jesus. You're gonna die for your own sin. And you're gonna pay the penalty for your own sin. Two people in this room, where do you land? This is an incredible question to answer. Because you're, listen to me, your answer now determines your forever answer in eternity. Where do you land with Jesus? What are you doing with Jesus? I'm not asking if you're good enough to go to heaven because none of us are. I'm asking you, what have you done with Jesus? Have you said yes to Jesus? Are you like the guy next to Jesus? Who goes, oh, I just want out. I just, I don't want to stop sinning. I don't want to get out of my sin. I just want to be forgiven for the consequences of it. This is incredible, an incredible question, in church, that we have to answer. Where do you stand with Jesus? What, what, what person do you represent on the other side of Jesus? This is incredible. And so here's what I want us to do. I want us to bow our heads and close our eyes, and I want us to answer that question. What am I doing with Jesus? And if you can't honestly answer that if I die today and I would go to heaven, You're on the wrong path. Remember, it's not your goodness to get you to heaven. It's Jesus' sacrifice to get you there. But you have to be willing to admit your sin and see your need for Jesus. I'm gonna ask you today, if nobody's looking around, but if you are in here today and you say, I know that if I die, I'm going to go to heaven. Not because I'm good, but because of what Jesus did for me. I just want you to raise your hand. If that's you, you know for a fact you're going to heaven. I want you to raise your hand. Some of your hands could be up. All right, you put your hands down. If you're in here and you didn't raise your hand, it's because A, you weren't listening. B, you didn't understand the question. Or C, you know that you're not a Christian and you're not saved. Well, here's what I want you to do. If you are in here and you know that you are not saved, and you've never admitted your sin, you, you haven't saw your need for Jesus, and you know right now that if you were to die, you don't have a promise of tomorrow, I want you to lift your hand. Here, hold on before you do. But you're going to be lifting it because you want to say yes to Jesus this morning. Does that mean that you have to be perfect to come to Jesus? <laughs> no, he took away the ladder. If you're in here, you say, you know what, Pastor Tony, I don't know that I would go to heaven when I die. I want to pray a prayer with you that you will know without a doubt that you will go to heaven when you die. Not because of what you did, but because of what Jesus did on the cross. So if that's in you, count of three, you want to say yes to Jesus this morning? Raise your hand high, one, two, three, and we're going to pray a prayer. If that's you, if you want to say yes to Jesus, then, then lift up your hand and we're going to pray a prayer. Come on. Don't just sit there and wait. Jesus, I just pray that you would have your way in this room right now. If 
you're in here and you know that you're not walking with Jesus, I just want you to pray the prayer. And then say, Jesus, forgive me. Forgive me of all my sin. Be Lord over my life. Help me to live for you. Help me to walk with you. I pray that you would live through me, Jesus. I would die to myself every single day, pick up my cross, and live for you. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the empty tomb. Thank you that my name is written in the book of life. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen, amen. Hey, look, celebrate people in the morning. So here's what I want to do. If you, get, if, you, if you pray that prayer, there's a booklet I want to give you at the, or that uh, Jennifer is going to go to the uh, guest service desk. I forgot what it's called there for a minute. And there's a book that it talks about salvation and how to have a relationship with Jesus. And uh, I encourage you to grab that book as you're going out. As you leave, grab one of these cards and start, I mean, grab multiple of these cards and invite people. Listen, well, I've, eight out of 10 will say yes if you invite them to church. Let's invite people to church. Let's invite people to have a relationship with Jesus. And then grab your act of kindness card, do something nice for somebody because one invite could change a life, but one act of kindness could change someone's day.